And before we listen to the message, we have a special music by uh, Julianne. Julianne.
And he was just about ready to make up his mind when he listened to the other side of the case. Then totally confused, he didn't know what to do. The people he first thought were innocent now appeared guilty. And those he thought were guilty now appeared innocent. He eventually gave up his job as a judge in despair. King James puts it this way. I could get on very well hearing one side only, but when both sides have been heard by my soul, I know not which is right. A confused judge will not make accurate decisions. God is an impartial, totally fair and accurate judge. He is not confused at all when he judges us. The Bible teaches us that each of us has a case pending before God. Even now, we are being given a summons to appear in the judgment, to give an account for the way we have conducted ourselves. Every man and woman who has ever graced the face of earth has a case pending before God, the highest court of the universe. The Apostle Paul tells us, He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world. No one will be excused. No one can escape the summons. The Bible clearly states that everyone will have to appear. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, whether we profess to be Christians or not, whoever we are, we must all appear. God has no favorites. When we are summoned by the court of heaven, we must appear. Why? So then, each of us shall give up give account of himself to God. The decision of heaven's court will forever seal the destiny of each person. And the decision will be irreversible, for there is no higher court of appeal. But before there can be a verdict or a sentence passed, there must be a trial or investigation. Let's turn to the Bible. And notice the picture of the tribunal or court session in heaven. Daniel. Daniel 7 verse 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wood. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Here Daniel pictures God the Father, or the Ancient of Days, seated upon his eternal throne and surrounded by countless angels. Now notice what Daniel saw next in his vision. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Here the Son of God is pictured standing before the Ancient of Days. How very much like a courtroom scene on earth. There is a presiding judge, the Ancient of Days. 
There are witnesses, the holy angels, who have seen and recorded everything. And standing before the throne is Jesus, man's advocate. As John wrote, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, you see, everyone seems to be present except the person who is to be tried. In essence, that is true. But let us notice what the Bible says. The court was seated and the books were open. Evidently, these books contain the records of the deeds of those who stand trial for Solomon wrote. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And Malachi continues, Then those who fear the Lord spoke one to another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. God notices every time our hearts are drawn to him. He marks down every word of encouragement that we give to somebody else and every deed of kindness. King David also knew about records, for he said, Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? God knows about our deepest sorrows. Of course, God knows all about us, for David also wrote, O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You are familiar with all my ways. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. While God knows all about us, it is not necessary for Him to keep records for His benefit. The records are kept for the benefit of the universe. So there is clear evidence of God's love and justice in every situation. Our accountability to God is a solemn thought. Everyone must give an account for the most precious gift we have received. The gift of life. This is what Solomon was talking about when he wrote in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the way of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Matthew continued along this path. He said, For every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Someone has estimated that the average person speaks enough words in one week to fill a book of 320 pages. The average person. <laughs> in 60 years, that could mean more than 3,000 such books. <clears throat> what will appear in the library of books, in your library of books, what will the record show? And more than that, 
even the motives behind those words will appear. Here's what Paul says. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. Scary, isn't it? There will be no erasures, no cover-ups in that day. Men may be able to fool friends, church members, even their families, but no one can fool God. He reads the secrets of the heart. You see, when judgment day comes, we will find ourselves in one of two positions. Either our entire record of past failures will have been covered by the blood of Jesus, or our record will stand to condemn us. And of course, it is not what we profess, but what we are and what we do that makes the difference. We are told that when Jesus comes, He will reward each according to His works. Or good works. I want to make this very clear. Our good works are not the basis of our salvation. Amen. God's grace is. But our good works do reveal that our hearts are committed to God. Now perhaps you are saying, if we are saved by grace, why are we judged by works? It's an interesting question. Dr. Sake Kubo recently wrote, <coughs> Let us consider what it would mean if the judgment were not based on works. By what would God judge us? Our skin? Our race? Our social class? Our education? Our looks? Our talents? or strength, or membership in the church, or our mere profession of Christ, God can only judge us. God can judge us only by our works, good <coughs> or bad. From the book, Your Summons to Court, page 20. God's works, obviously, are not done by the truth, they are the spontaneous result of a heart full of love for God and man. It is a love relationship with Jesus that motivates his followers to do good works. Summing up in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and, give and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Since man's relationship to Christ is to be judged by his conduct, there must be some clear standard by which to measure that conduct. In our judicial procedures, here on earth. The usual purpose of a court trial is to determine if a crime has been committed, if a law has been broken. Only when a law has been violated can a man be found guilty. In God's judgment, there is a law or standard, and James makes it clear which law will be upheld. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. In the previous verse, James mentions two of the commandments. Do not commit adultery and do not kill. So obviously, God's Ten Commandment law 
is called the law of liberty, by which the lives of men will be judged. The judgment will simply determine on which side we stand in the great controversy. Are we with Christ? Have we let Him live out His life within us? Have we had a supreme love for Him and His will as expressed in the Ten Commandments? Is it our desire to follow Him and live by His strength? Has He written His law in our hearts? You see, when immigrants desire to become citizens of a country, they are required to pledge their allegiance to that country, promising to be loyal citizens and to uphold the laws of the land. Just so with Christians, when they accept Christ and desire to become citizens of His kingdom, God asks them to pledge their love and allegiance to Him and to uphold the laws of his government. However, not all immigrants remain faithful to their solemn vows. Some outwardly seem to be loyal citizens of the land, but later are found to be subversive. When this is proved, the citizenship of the person is revoked and he is deported. Likewise, not all Christians have been faithful to their vows. It is not enough to be declared righteous now. We must remain faithful to Him until He comes. It is not enough to profess that we are followers of Christ. We must allow Jesus' perfect life of obedience and faithfulness to be lived out in us. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The whole controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, is about God's character of love. And the law is a written standard of that character. Small wonder it figures prominently in the final judgment. <coughs> but a most astounding fact, little known by Christians, is that the heavenly court is already in session. The heavenly court is already in session. In fact, the Bible's last book, Revelation, reveals that God's judgment is actually taking place now. That is why, in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, John outlines the world's last warning and invitation in these words. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. You will notice that this message does not say the judgment will come. It says the hour of His judgment has come. The second part of the threefold message calls God's people out of the false religious system that will exist in the last days. The final part of this last message to the world warns God's people 
to beware of worshipping the beast power of Revelation 13. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now notice verses 14 and 15 which followed the proclamation of the three angels' message. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What is the harvest of the earth? It is the end of the world. The harvest refers to the second coming of Christ. What occurs before the second coming of Christ? God's judgment. His judgment reveals who is ready for his return. But we must pause to investigate this matter a little more. Maybe you're wondering, when did this judgment begin? The key is found in the book of Daniel. A remarkable prophecy, the longest prophecy in the Bible. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. In prophecy, we note that a day represents a year. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Ezekiel 4, verse 6. So 2,300 days represents 2,300 years. The 2,300 years are part of a comprehensive prophecy found in Daniel 7, 8, and 9. This prophecy pinpoints the exact date for the baptism and crucifixion of our Lord. It also reveals exactly when the judgment will begin. These 2,300 days or 2,300 years period began at the command of King Artaxerxes to restore Jerusalem and rebuild its economy. The Israelites had been captives in Babylon for 70 years and they longed to go home and rebuild their beloved city. Finally, in the year 457 BC, the king issued the long-awaited decree, 2300 years from that date terminates in 1844. Let's now go back to our text. We can we skip the, the pin. On to 2,300 prophetic days or literal years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We have seen that the prophecy runs out in 1844. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? <clears throat> in 1844, what the Bible describes as God's judgment hour began. The clock struck the hour. You might ask, how does the judgment relate to this cleansing of the sanctuary Daniel foretold would occur at the end of the 2000s? 300 years or days. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? What does it have to do with the judgment? The Bible describes two sanctuaries, one on earth and the other in heaven. In ancient Israel, the people daily brought their sacrifices to the sanctuary. They were to confess their sins and take the life of a lamb to show their faith in the future death of Jesus, the Son of God. Today, 
If we sin, we ask God to forgive our sins because Jesus died in our place to pay the sin debt. However, before Calvary, the people had no sacrifice to look back to, so by faith, they looked forward instead for the time when the Lamb of God would die for them. By the act of sacrificing an innocent animal, they acknowledged their belief in a Savior who would come and die to make it possible for them to have forgiveness. Then their sins were symbolically transferred to the sanctuary by the priest sprinkling the blood from the animal before the veil of the most holy place in the sanctuary. Then one day each year the children of Israel held a most solemn and sacred service called the Day of Atonement or the cleansing of the sanctuary. For the people of Israel it was a time of judgment. Ten days before the judgment, the Day of Atonement, the trumpets were sounded, reminding the Israel, Israelites that it was time for them to take inventory, to look into themselves, to repent and to confess their sins. All who failed to do so were put out of the camp. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now the book of Hebrews makes it plain that the earthly sanctuary and its service was an illustration of the sanctuary in heaven where Christ our high priest forgave our sins. Paul says, We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Again, but Christ, being come an high priest, by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Christ's death on Calvary provided a complete sacrificial atonement for our sins. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. The true tabernacle or sanctuary is in heaven. Everything which happens on earth is a reflection of what takes place in heaven. Jesus is the Lamb who dies. Jesus is the priest who lives. Jesus is our great high priest. Just as Israel's high priest entered the most holy place once a year, so Jesus at the end of time entered the most holy place to perform his work of judgment. In the judgment, it is our relationship and attitude toward Christ which determines our eternal destiny. Christ longs to save us. He is doing everything he can to save us. He says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, you don't have to stand in the judgment alone. If we have confessed, he will forgive us our sins. If we are Christ, He is our advocate. Through Jesus, we will stand before God as if we have never sinned. Our records will show only the lovely life of our Savior. And we get credit for His perfect life. There is nothing to fear about the judgment day. For those who love and follow Jesus with all their heart and soul. For Jesus will present the merits of his own shed blood to cover every confessed sin. For John wrote, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are living in earth's last hours. The pre-advent judgment has been convening in the court of heaven. No doubt. 
The judgment began with Abel, the first righteous person who died on planet earth. Paul wrote, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. In other words, judgment begins with those who profess to be God's children. We can just imagine, in our, through our mind's eye, Abel's day in court. As his case comes up to court, God sees the life of Abel, and there is the record of his acceptance of the death of the Lamb of God. One of the last acts of Abel recorded in the Bible was the sacrifice he offered, showing his faith in the coming Redeemer. The life of Christ is credited to his account. His sins are all covered by the blood of Christ. You can be assured that Jesus, Abel's advocate, stretched out his nail-pierced hands and said, My blood, Father, pay Abel's debt. And can't you just hear those countless angels rejoice as Jesus says, Keep Abel's name in the book of life. And his name is still there. Just as Christ promised, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And no doubt, Judas' name, Judas' name has also been raised in heaven's court. Judas had been a follower of Jesus. One of his disciples. He was not all bad, but his life did not measure up to his profession. He didn't love Christ supremely. At times he was drawn to Christ, but one weakness led to another until he sold his master for 30 pieces of silver. Then in anguish he hanged himself. Jesus loved Judas. He even stopped, stooped to wash Judas' dusty feet the night of the Last Supper. Jesus hoped to touch his heart. He wanted to be able to stand in the judgment and say, Lord, Father, he is mine. But Judas rejected. He turned away. How sad it must have been when Jesus looked over the records and came upon Judas' name. All righteousness will not do in the judgment. Isaiah says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Only those who have continued to make Christ first in their life can wear Christ's robe of righteousness. Without that, no man can be vindicated in the judgment. So Judas' is name is wiped out of the book of life. It is a solemn time in which we live. Just like the Israelites, we need to be taking that inner look, taking stock of our lives. We need to maintain our commitment to Jesus as it is the only possible preparation for our time in court. Soon, man's probation will close. And the decree will go forth. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. At that time, the mercy and pardon God has so long been stretching out will be withdrawn. The saddest words in the human language will then be spoken. It will be the words of those people who had put off salvation for another time. They will say, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Then Jesus returns to earth, we read, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. Jesus long to be your advocate in the judgment. He longs to have you accept his sacrifice on Calvary. He longs to have you confess your sins to him so he can blot them out. He longs to have your name written in the book of life. 
John describes those who will and who will not enter the holy city. But there shall by no means enter into anything, enter it, anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Would you like to open your hearts to Jesus right now? Would you like to ask Him to take your life to take away from your life anything that prevents you from going to the kingdom? In the judgment, God reveals everything about us. Everything is exposed before the universe. All sins are recorded. Would you like your sins covered? Covered by the blood of the Lamb? Would you like Jesus to step forward and say, Yes, Father, this man, this woman is mine. I have forgiven their sins. I have canceled their debt. I have pardoned their guilt. Their sins are covered with my blood. Block them out of the records forever. Jesus stands at heaven's throne. He stands there in the judgment right now. This very moment, will you come to Him? Will you give Him your whole life? If you want to give Him your life, why not stand with me as we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our sacrifice, our high priest, or mediator. Lord, we know that we have not always been consistent in accepting and living according to your precepts. We pray and confess, Lord, that we have fallen short of your grace. We ask, Lord, that you will cover us with your righteousness. Blot out our sins and write our names in the Lamb's book of life. Father, when you come, may all of us here and those who have professed and followed your commands. Be among that great number that shall hail you as Lord and Savior of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we sing.